and so is the United States. But there are a lot of other countries that don't recognize that at all. So, so does that mean the people who live there aren't entitled to it, to those rights? I mean, I mean of, according to the United Nations, they are, but that government isn't being held responsible for holding up those rights. Okay, that's, so, that's a different, that's accountability. That's accountability. I think it's a great point. But I want, I want to go back to the point, which is they're entitled to it. That's like asking eat. if you're entitled to food. Like, of course we're entitled to food. We go eat when we're hungry. We drink when we're thirsty. But there are people dying all over the world of starvation, and we're – I mean, there's not a lot you can do. It's, I mean, it's not as much in the United States, but still, once again – those governments aren't upholding what they decided to agree on with the United Nations. So is it really the citizen's fault, or is it the citizen's job, or is it the government who just – or the government officials who decided to run? And I it's, – I, it's definitely a right, a human right, or even privilege, what Patrick, I believe, was saying. Oh, Boston. Okay, and so, I mean, I, it's probably more the government than the okay. citizens who are responsible for upholding these human rights, because if you can have human rights all day, but unless they're recognized, it means nothing. Okay, good. So, so now you're talking practicalities. I guess I'm kind of in the theory world talk, you know, asking the questions, do you have that entitlement? And I think you're agreeing with me that you have it, it just might not be enforced. Because yeah. going back to my original question is, do you have a right to water? So yes, it may not be enforced, but do you have that water right? And if yeah. it could if be enforced, then... If it's something you need to survive, I would say it's probably in the most profound right you have. If it's something you need to survive, yeah. food, mm -hmm. water, and... You don't need – it's kind of going back to the want versus need. You can want fried chicken all day or you could want a mimosa or something all day, but you don't need that. You need water. You need certain ratios of protein to carbohydrates to fats. So if you stuck by those and actually looked down – because it also depends on where you're located in the world. Some um, – climates that are hotter, they probably need more water to survive and yeah. or food depending on where you are. Like it, it's all relative to where you are, but if we went off exactly what the body needs, then we could probably solve a lot more of issues of what's going on with starvation and thirst. I mean, most of the water scarcity is mismanagement of the watersheds we already have and of leaky pipes and everything. So if we could go to our innate right of what we need to survive and all the governments enforced it and kind of helped each other out, even if it's a trading system to where, oh, you have oil? Oh, okay, well, we'll give you some water if we could do, what is it, a barter system? I think that's what it's called. <coughs> you could probably solve a lot more than, oh, who has the money to do this and that? Well, if we helped each other out with what you need versus what you need, then we could probably work out some sort of system instead of it being, oh, who has the most money and who can do this and this and this? Because it's going to end up probably being that one day because money is not going to matter anymore when it's just what we need. As much as I, 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 I love your comments. I, I, I love the fact that you, you seem very, very uh, uh, emotional about it because oh, it, yeah. it, it's the practical aspects. And, and some of you are really focusing on the practicality of this. And I, I guess what I'm trying to do, and maybe you need to indulge me a little bit, I'm trying to stay in the theory of it, so to, you know, the, the theory of what a right is, so that if and when we're ready to go into practicality, into enforcement, into a implementation and application, maybe we'll be better uh, able to implement it in such a way because we understand the theory. And it's really hard to understand human rights theory and certainly whether we have a human right to water uh, as a theoretical matter. 
So, yes, the body needs a certain amount of water and you need a certain amount of food and, you, and, and governments aren't providing that to many of their citizens around the world. So is it a failure of government? Is it a failure to articulate the human right? Is it a failure of uh, is some other kind of mismanagement? And I think that this is where if we can at least understand what exactly the right is, if there's a right, then maybe there's a better way to enforce it and implement it and maybe get other, other entities, governments, and so on to, to, uh, to implement it. Um, you mentioned um, the uh, universe, I think you, were, you intended to mention the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. And I also want to bring up, and that was uh, adopted in 1945. You also have the UN Charter, uh, I'm sorry, that was 1948. The UN Charter was 1945. You also have the uh, the two international covenants, one's on civil and political rights and one is on economic, social, cultural rights. Uh, and I think Professor Harberger talks about them in one of in her articles. Yeah. Um, and those were in 67, um, European yeah, Convention of Protection. About he talked a lot about um, like human rights versus uh, <clears throat> moral rights and how those are kind of different. I, I, I forget what he wrote about that, but he made a distinction between the two. If, yeah. yeah. I'd have to look at what he said, but I remember him making well, a distinction. Yeah, let, let, well, let, me, let me just really come back to that because I want to – you have all these diff different international instruments and documents – and they talk about the right to food, and the right. They talk about the right to life, and they talk about the right to health, and they talk about even the right to environment, and they never once mention the word water. What happened? This is one of the problems, one of the troubling aspects of people you know, asking the question: Do we have a, a, a right to water? What happened with water? It, it could be they just assumed it would be included in the other yeah. other items. I don't have a good answer to that one because I don't know if anybody can answer. But it, there's there's a lot of people writing and saying, oh, they just forgot it or they just assumed it's included. Um, it was uh, unintentional uh, maybe, mistake. Maybe they never thought that it would get to this point that we would maybe. have to actually talk about who's getting to drink water and who's not. Yeah. Maybe yeah. they thought, it, yeah, it would never come to this. Like food, yeah. you can grow food, you can not grow food, but at the time when they wrote this, water was everywhere and we weren't having yeah. these problems. But now, maybe there needs to be an amendment added or that one word added on to the right to food, environment, and everything. So yeah. maybe that's just, they just, never thought we would get to this point. Yeah, and, and I don't have a good answer to why it's not in there, that there's another argument that says that it doesn't matter that it's not in there, that it exists because of what's called customary international law. The, the, the fact that it, it, it it's uncod unwritten, uncodified law. It's international and that's accepted. Um, so just, just keep that in the back of your mind. I want to ask you guys uh, sort of a, a, another level of question, and again, this is, again, indulge me on the theory of it, because I think this is, this will help you, I'm hoping, in terms of the implement, implementation, trying to be practical about it. Um, if it was to be included in any of these documents, what kind of a right would you want it to be? Would it be an affirmative right or a negative right? Let me give you the examples. Uh, if you look at our Bill of Rights, okay, you have here, uh, Congress shall make no law respecting establishment of religion or prohibiting free exercise thereof or freedom of speech. So Congress shall not infringe on all these freedoms that you have, all these rights that you have. Um, if you look at the second one, shall not be infringed. So again, Congress shall not infringe upon your uh, right to bear and keep, keep and bear arms. Third one, about quartering, Congress shall not do that. Fourth one, the, uh, Congress shall not interfere with all these things. Fifth, these are all negative rights. 
And if you look at them collectively, they've also been called liberty rights, civil and political rights, uh, and all uh, and all the the documents. When you look at all the instruments that talk about food, environment, health, shelter, those are all written in an affirmative language. The government shall provide. So if you look at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and I apologize, I didn't get it on the screen, but it, it says that the governments must provide it to all its citizens. So food, health, shelter, a minimum standard of, of, of uh, health and environment is an affirmative right. That it, sh it shall be provided. Where is water? Should it be a negative right or should it be a positive right? Should the government affirmatively have to provide it or should it just uh, not have to prevent you from obtaining it? Who's, who's intended to pay for that? Good question. By the way, did, did, you, did you see all the affirmative uh, obligation in the Bill of Rights? Yeah, we got that. Yeah. There aren't any. There aren't any. And in fact, uh, do we have a right to food in the U.S.? No, you have right to earn to it. Right to shelter? Nope. Right to a job? Nope. We're, we're, we're starved on rights, aren't we, in the U.S.? I think the only basic right you have is to fight for what you need and more. Okay. Right. Self-preservation. <laughs> yeah. I mean. so. In, in the U.S., we have a, a slightly different perspective on rights than uh, at least uh, some of the some other uh, countries. What what's that? No, I just said that the mic is open in Galveston, so they wanted to make a comment. Go ahead. We're going to jump okay. in in a minute. Okay. Well, the the, the perspectives that there, there's a little bit of different perspectives that. In the U.S., we seem to like negative rights, so we and we haven't implemented any positive rights. No right to food, to job, to health, to to all those kinds of things. But we have all, all this bill of rights, and they're all negative rights. They're all political, civil, and political rights. In Europe and and, and quite a number of other countries around the world, they've got they have those negative rights, civil and political rights, but they also have some affirmative rights, such as a right to right to health and health care. Um, and food and shelter and all and some of these other things. There's a handful of countries that have also included a right to water, and it's been litigated, especially in South Africa, about whether it's a negative right or affirmative right. I want to get your sense. Should this be, you know, after air, you need water. That's the next most important thing for life. Should that be an affirmative right or a negative right? I think it should be affirmative because, um, like with civil rights, the government can't take away something from you. But so if you're in a geological area that there isn't a lot of water, the government isn't taking it away from you, but you still don't have it. So if it's an affirmative right, the government must provide you with water. Right. At your house? <laughs> no, not necessarily, but... In like the city square. Access. In the city square. Ah. <laughs> because there's a lot. There's, there's you know, I, I don't know why, but there's some folks living in Death Valley. Um, lots of folks li living in rural areas of Arizona and New Mexico and Utah and Nevada. Is the government obligated to provide them with water affirmatively? No, it would be a mistake for the government to have to do that. Why a mistake? Well, you know, there's a little bit of common sense that needs to be put into this. <laughs> if you're going to build a home in the desert, you do that of your own self-direction. You don't need the government to come in and say, oh, by the way, we forgot to tell you there's no water here, so here's our truckload of water for you. <laughs> so you know, should we, should, are, you say, are you suggesting that there should not be a human right to water in the United States? Absolutely. There shouldn't be a right to something that doesn't make common sense or application work. 
A few of us have to do the thinking for a lot of people. <laughs> well, a lot and of people here were saying there should be a human right to water. Well, <laughs> uh, let, let's, let's, let's go through that for a minute. If there's supposed to be a human right for water and it should be enforceable by the government, who's going to ultimately pay for that nonsense? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, folks. I think we all pay for this. You know, and as a society, we pay taxes to provide certain services that, as individuals, it would not be practical for us to do. So, you know, part of paying taxes and part of our system of government governance allows for things like infrastructure and providing things like water that are not practical on, on an individual basis. So who pays for it? We all do. We all benefit. Some people may pay more if they use more. Some people pay less if they, if they don't. And there are some people who have no ability to pay for it. But if they don't have an ability to pay for it, to say that they don't have a right to um, at least have access to water, seems morally wrong. And I think generally that's not something that um, uh, Americans are willing to accept. No, no, we cannot take on the responsibility for continuing to pay for things that people shouldn't need. They shouldn't need water if they move to an area that doesn't have any water. What they need to do is move away from that area. Yeah, I don't think the argument is really the, that you know, the government should provide water to people that live in the middle of the desert. I think the question is, you know, do uh, people in general have the right to have access to water? The people that live in the middle of the desert, they have access. They can go drive to wherever the you know, water is and they can pick it up and take it out to their house. That's a different form of access. Am I responsible to deliver to them? No. Because I agree with you, that doesn't seem uh, like common sense. So I, you know, maybe we're talking about two different things, but um, I was trying to respond to your question about who pays for it. But let me give you a, a, an example that's not a great analogy, but maybe it might give you some thought. Fire department. Do you have a right to have the fire department come and, and protect your house from fire? We pay for it, so we're we're paying for a benefit that's not an entitlement. But we're not. But then some of us said that water isn't and should be an entitlement, and we don't get it. Are you entitled to police protection? No, you get it because we pay taxes for it. You get it because we pay taxes. So it's more important for us to pay for fire department and police things that we're not entitled to. But not not for water. But some of you were saying that water isn't should be an entitlement, a human right. I think part of the problem in the developed world is that uh, sometimes people feel like since it is an entitlement and since they're entitled to water, that they don't have. To to pay for it, and, or at least uh, not as much. And then I know that there's the problem, like you mentioned in uh, South Africa, the, the people that couldn't pay for it, well, um, the water got turned off. And so yeah. there's the argument of, well, if you can't pay for it, do you deny them access to it? Or do they have an innate right to have access to it? Um, it's a great point because let's let's move away from the Death Valley example. There's a couple of hundred thousands, if not millions, of people living on the U.S.-Mexico border on the on the U.S. side, in colonias and in other you know, small uh, 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 villages that are that don't have running water. Is anybody obligated to provide them with running water, or in Appalachia? or in some other communities uh, that are not as remote as the middle of the desert. Folks in Appalachia have been li living there for generations and still don't have running water. Is that, 
their own problem? It's by their choice. Okay. We've got to somehow, yeah, we've got to somehow divorce ourselves from thinking that if we don't care for somebody, we're not, we're doing something wrong. We can't continue to do that. Well, is water then not a human right? And they're not entitled to water. They're entitled for something that they can pay for. What if they can't afford it? Then they need to move. What if they can't afford to move? Then that helps me clarify my point even more. Why do we need to constantly subsidize issues that promote this never-ending chain of who pays for something so that somebody can enjoy what people that work and develop themselves enjoy? Okay. Let me ask you this. Where do you want them to move? We're kind of talking over here in College Station. Where are you expecting these people to move, the ones that are in the middle of the desert, not doing anything, waiting for you to pay for their water to be delivered to their house? Oh, yeah, that's a good point. Kids or elderly, they can't just pack up their bags and go to a big city that's going to be overpopulated and they're going to have a bunch of other issues. But we're kind of curious, where are they supposed to move? Why did they move there to begin with? Let me ask you this. Why, why did people move to Detroit? For work. Okay. So, so why aren't they moving away now when the city is uh, turning their water off? Because they're waiting for somebody to pay their water bill. Um, okay, what about they all the people that pay. originated from a certain region? People who grew up in tribes in Africa who, you know, have been living on certain areas and they don't have the ability to move or all their children or all their elderly and all their sick who can't move, don't have the money to move. And then if they do move to areas that have water, everyone's going to just move there and then it's going to be overpopulated and then you're going to use all the water and you're going to be back to square one. So what do you do then? Does anybody in there, do you, do you know the definition of survive? But what about children? <clears throat> it's their parents' responsibility to make sure that they survive because they can't. Natural selection. There you go. Oh, so that, sir, we're just going to kill selection. off all the little children who can't grow <laughs> and can't get to I'm water. That, that makes sense. I didn't say kill anybody. That's just natural selection. Well, they can't, if they can't drink water and they can't move, they die. Kids, okay, so people, what about, little what about children animals? who starve and can't get to food banks, they so die. What about the stray dogs and cats on the side of the road? Do they have a right to water as a living being? We're not I'm talking, not about, we're talking about humans. We're not talking about dogs. Well, I mean, they're both living this, beings. That's a completely so different topic because... Animal rights are so far out of whack. If we're, if you want to talk about human or animal rights, we can talk about that. But the United States has like some of the best animal rights compared to, let's say, China, who has none, and they're still skinning animals alive. But if you want to talk about animal rights, we can. Yeah, by all means. I mean, if you want to bring China into it, they say you can only have one child. No, but but let's. I mean, we're overpopulated here, so they at least have the right idea. So you're talking about killing babies before they're born? But let's no. Let, let's focus on the issue of providing water, because the, the, I, I want to make sure that we're we're not getting too far astray. Because if we're talking about this idea of whether we have a human right to water, and if it exists, if it doesn't exist, then what do people who don't have access and don't have the ability to move to to that access or the the money to even to buy it? Because access doesn't mean free. Right. So what if what are people who don't even have the money to to purchase water, even though it might be not an access issue, it's it's, it's available. What do they do? Is there any obligation from anybody to help them? Yeah, I think um, I guess answering the desert question. Part of the reason why I mean America, in my opinion, is the greatest country in the world, is because we do <laughs> accept the moral obligation to help out people within society that otherwise wouldn't I mean be able to access the water 
or whatnot. So I don't think his argument is really, um, I mean, it's kind of not quite for, for future thinking, if you will. I mean, there, there, there's an argument that you know you, the, the bootstrap argument. You do your, you know you do it on your own, and, and you sur you survive, and you do it yourself. There's a lot of folks who uh, haven't been able to uh, do that, and so the question is, do we just let them die off, uh, I mean, or I guess people could use the natural selection argument, but as a civilized world, we've kind of moved beyond that, and now we have morals and things like that. Right. I'm just saying that there's not a natural right to it. But I mean, as society, we should be morally, morally open to helping people. I'm just saying there's not an actual right to that water. Ah, but do so. This this brings up that issue, the question of the moral points or moral rights versus legal rights. You can't enforce morality. No, morality comes from a higher level than okay. the creator of the law. Okay, but what if people don't want to be moral? Then that's their choice. Okay, so that means people die because people don't want to be I mean, moral. If, if you can't take care of yourself and other people don't want to be moral to help you, then I mean, there's no other choice. No other choice. I mean, if you can't rely on yourself and others aren't going to let you rely on them, then yeah, you're going to die. Um, well, an example that you can bring up that like a bunch of superpowers will come together to solve a problem is the Kyoto Protocol. Okay, there's something that out, out there that says superpowers come together, stem what they are doing to the environment, uh, and we all make a, a, a difference as one. Now, the, the issue is not, of course, uh, greenhouse gas emissions right now. It's water scarcity where people are having it the hardest in Africa and uh, those other countries that I can't think of. Or, that's a continent. But, yeah, um, so right now all I'm hearing is that it's just not, it's not available, it's not possible, where that is something that has uh, been stemmed because it was a bunch of superpowers coming together to, for a common goal. So I know that's a little bit off uh, in another direction, but I think it does go back to, you know, there is a possibility that all of our superpowers can come together and, and provide something to uh, those who need it. <laughs> But is that a moral right or is that a legal obligation? Because if we're trying to implement this, if we're trying to implement this, we have um, to have some standard to go by. I think that in, since 2005, um, under Baki Moon, like when he was in um, the UN uh, General Secretary or whatever, um, when they it's the responsibility to protect. And so that's when they've used for civil wars. And I think the same concept can be applied to here. Um, just, it's, I think it's a, both a legal and a moral obligation to help out when you can. And I don't think that it's just necessarily a responsibility of the United States. But a lot of what I hear so far is people missing this concept of sovereignty. And so, you, the people of countries make a pact with their governments in order to protect them, provide security, um, give them certain rights and resources. Um, in return, we give up things. And, but when a country fails in those innate human rights, it's then the responsibility of the international community on a whole to step in. Okay. I was going to say, yeah, on the topic of government and what you talked about in the Kyoto Protocol, I think there's 2.6 billion reasons and 2.6 billion people out there that show that governments have continued to fail and continue to work together, or have failed to continue to work together. So I don't think government is necessarily the answer, and I don't think that the international community is ever going to reach out, especially when you look at water security, um, and you know, people want to be better our country than your country. Which gets me to the point of privatization. <laughs> <laughs> Privatized water. There we go. Okay. And privatized water means what? It means the government needs to do what's best for its people. And if that is allowing private involvement and private investment, then that's what they need okay. to do. And what, if, what about the people who can't afford to buy water? Um, well, going back to the 
Kaka or the uh, Bolivia example, that was just an increase in the water. So they weren't, they weren't cutting off access. So, I mean, Well, it, it just seems to me that, we, that we, we have some folks here that aren't agreeing that there's a human right to water, and some folks that are saying there is a human right to water. So this, this is one of the challenges we have. Uh, the United States, when it's gone into these international debates over the human right to water, it's always abstained. Always abstained. Uh, because it doesn't want to affirmatively make a, 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 a statement that there is a human right to water because of obligations to provide water because if there's a right that means it's against the government and then the government must provide it in the US and a handful of other countries have been very reluctant uh, countries in Europe countries in Africa Latin America have been very uh, um, uh, aggressive or more aggressive about arguing that there is a human right to water and so this is Would something that has still not been you know, completely figured out internationally whether it exists or not exists as a, a definitive human right. Would yeah. that still be true if it was a negative right instead of a positive right? So Great would question. it would what you just said still be true if um, if it was more phrased of the government uh, will not impede access to water versus uh, the government <laughs> will provide water? Yeah. And that's part of the debate that's going on right now is what does the human right to water really mean? Is it affirmative? Is it negative? Is it an, uh, simply an access or do you have to provide some, some minimum quantity? World Health Organization says that the average global amount necessary for life is something like uh, uh, 50 liters per day. And it just varies. I mean, if you live in sub-Saharan Africa, it's probably higher. If you live in... in uh, Washington State, where you know it's really humid, it, you need less. Uh, it, it really depends on the environment, but that's that's a health standard, not necessarily a human rights standard. And how much you get, or how much you're entitled to, or what exactly you're entitled to, is still has not been fully addressed. Many people say that the right exists, but there's still debate about what it really is. Is it a actual amount or isn't it? As I said, the U.S. has been very reluctant to, to uh, uh, commit to something like that, including as a negative right. Included is simple access. Um, because there's still an obligation there on the government to take some kind of steps or at least to not take some kind of steps. Uh, and other countries have said that there there is a human right and the weight seems to be tipping towards a negative right. Simply, they shall not prevent access, uh, not, pro not affirmatively provide access. But that's still being debated internationally. Um, you, you started this, Tom, you started out with the uh, example about Brazil and those rights when they increased to 200%. That was more for lifestyle. The people had a lifestyle of using a lot of water instead of the whatever amount is necessary for life. And that those were the ones that were essentially revolting against the increase in price. Or did I did I miss that? Well, they just no, no, no. It was it was Bolivia, and it was a, a very and it wasn't just the the the, the haves that were revolting. It was actually the have-nots. The folks who were, some of many of which were connected to the original system, to the original grid, and were paying somewhere between 10 to 30 percent of their income towards water. And now that you've had an increase of somewhere between 40 to 200 percent, it's a larger percentage of their income that's now going towards water. So it wasn't uh, folks in, in the country filling up swimming pools or having big lawns or yards and so on. Um, it was it was a a uh, a, a whatever you, I'm not sure what you ter the term is the, the the population the average population that was revolting against that kind of water increase and it was thousands of people tens of thousands of people who were part of that uh, revolt. And so from, from what I read, that also looked like a, a deal that was doomed to kind of lose from the beginning because the this private company assumed like 30 million dollars worth of the. I guess public government debt to even get into the deal, 
So it could have just been a bad, I mean, bad corporate deal from the beginning. It could have been one from the beginning, and that's that, the corporation, you know, that's the risk they take. There are other examples where corporations have gone in and privatized a utility in agreement with either the city government or the national government, and the deals have gone off very well. There's many examples of good failures and good examples of where it's actually worked out pretty well. Let me, we're going to wrap up soon. Let me just ask you one more question, so I want to take it to one more level, okay? And for those of you that are not comfortable with the idea of a human right to water, just humor me. Let's say there is a human right to water, and we're talking about governments, okay? Government protecting it for the citizens. Somebody, a number of you were talking about at the UN level, at the international level, talking about Canada with water and other countries without. Does the, if there is a human right to water, does the U.S. owe that human right to Mexico? U.S. has a lot more water and a lot more water per capita than Mexico does. So now the question is not, is that right enforceable by a citizen against their own government, but is that right enforceable by an individual against any other government, and can one government hold it against another government? You don't like any of this, do you? No, I'm just saying, where does it stop? Where does it stop? Okay. Yeah, I guess alternatively, does that mean that Mexico would have an obligation or right to us to manage their water supply at the same level of efficiency that we are, and not waste as much? Well, let me ask you this. If you have a right to life, that right to life is held up against your government. Does Mexico have, are Mexicans entitled to the right to life under the U.S. legal system while residing in Mexico? No. Okay. Mexicans coming into the U.S., are they entitled to that kind of protection under the U.S. legal system? I think they are. I don't know if it's necessarily supposed to be that way. Okay. So if there's a right to water, is that only to citizens or? People residing here. People residing here? What about our citizens overseas? You had a? I was going to say, it seems like it starts as a moral obligation, and then it turns into a legal obligation if there's an agreement between two like parties, like, you know. Two countries. Two countries. Okay. Or if, you know, kind of the same problem from the individual level, but on a different scale. But if it's an agreement between two countries, the right comes from a contract, not from a human right. A contract called a treaty, right? Yeah. But you're, I guess, you know, I see some of the same issues or complexities, you know, that you run into between people, two individuals, but it's just on a larger scale. You have moral, you know, obligations. Yeah. And then if, but if you have an agreement with them, it turns into a, you could have a contract with your neighbor and it turns into a legal obligation. And then, and just to your point about where does it stop, that's exactly what I wanted to figure out. What are the parameters of, if there's a human right, what are the parameters? Who enjoys it? How much? In what context? Against whom? Who's, who gets to enforce it? And so this, I'm hoping for some of you that were, they're arguing about the fact that, you know, it's not being enforced. How do we enforce it? How do we get countries to enforce human rights? Well, if we can maybe articulate exactly what the right is, if it actually exists, then maybe we have a better chance of trying to enforce it. So, for example, we have freedom, freedom of speech. We know it's a negative right. We know it's a citizen against their own government, not against any other governments. And internationally, countries don't interfere with each other's freedom of speech, right? They complain about it. They are, they, they, they claim, they make claims that you're violating your own citizens' human rights, but they don't necessarily interfere. At what point do we interfere with another country's implementation or enforcement or lack of enforcement? I feel like if it's a human right, going back to the, the question that you posed about the U.S. and Mexico, 
I feel like if if there was a problem identified in Mexico, that it would be the responsibility of the Mexican government and the U.S. government to uh, come up with a feasible solution. So whether that is the U.S. sending um, maybe water professionals or water engineers to improve um, their situation in, in that respect, or whether it's actually the physical delivery of water to Mexico, um, I feel like it would be up to to those uh, governments to come up with whatever solution is reasonable for them. Uh, now, what is reasonable? I mean, I, that's that's up to speculation. Uh, but and I feel like that could work for a lot of transboundary issues. Uh, if it was identified either by Mexico, they're saying we need help, or whether it's identified by um, an international entity like the UN saying, you know, Mexico has a problem, US, Canada, neighboring countries, you need to come up with some sort of way to help them. And, and that's, again, under the, under the impression that water is already a human right. Well, and, and that's, I think that's the point there, that if it is a human right, it does it extend as between countries? Because if it does, then it's obligatory. It's, it, there's an obligation for the U.S. to help Mexico. And if it's not obligatory, if it doesn't extend to that level, then any kind of uh, arrangement becomes contractual. We just call it a treaty. And any kind of violations is based on the treaty. And if the treaty recognizes violations and damages, then you have a cause of action. But if the treaty that says nothing about, well, if you violated, these are the consequences, then there's no, there's no uh, violation, there's no enforcement, there's no enforcement mechanism, and you're not bound by anything. But again, if it's, if it's a human rights that applies as between countries, it doesn't matter what the treaty says, because it's, there's a universal human right that says it. But if there isn't, then we have to, to, to look at it from a different perspective. If it's only subject to a, a citizen enforcing rights against their government, then other governments should be able to come in and say, hey, you're violating, you're enforcing, you're not living up to whatever standards. And I asked a question earlier about at what point have we ever interfered with other governments' mechanism or system? And really the only examples I can come up with are violations of the laws of war. So genocide, crimes against humanity, um, and uh, piracy. Those are the only ones where governments have actually invaded uh, or, or if they were attacked directly or indirectly. So U.S. has attacked a couple of other countries because they, they of the claim that, they, that the U.S. was attacked. So that was sort of a, a defensive uh, right. Other than that, whether there are human rights or not, we generally don't interfere with those human rights within those countries. We argue and complain about them, but we usually leave it to the governments to each country to uh, try to figure it out domestically. And that probably doesn't help those of you that were arguing at the, you know, for UN in, in, uh, uh, efforts and obligations on countries to help countries with water to help countries without water. But that seems to be the consensus that we have generally developed around the world. May I ask a question from Galveston? Sure. Do you consider water a common property resource or not? Are we living in Texas or are we living somewhere else? <laughs> <laughs> These are general <laughs> theoretical considerations we've had. So <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a great question because everywhere in the world and in most of the U.S. states, water is uh, uh, a common pool resource held by the state on, for, for the trust of its citizens. There are exceptions, Texas and groundwater. Um, and there's, there's maybe a handful of other minor exceptions, but generally it is a resource held in trust for its citizens. But it's not held collectively as a nation. So water in Texas is not being held in trust for folks in Louisiana or Oklahoma. Only for Texans.
So I don't know if that responds directly to your question, but sort of, maybe. All right, unless there are any other comments or thoughts. All right, we're going to continue this line of, of inquiry when we get into the next uh, section, which is on values. So this is going to bring in some of the morality. It's also going to bring in some water ethics. And uh, I think I have an exercise I'm going to have some of you guys, or all, everybody do in class next week. Also between now and next week, um, I'm going to assign teams. And I'm going to make sure these are going to be cross-college teams. Uh, because in about three weeks, I'm going to ask some of you to, or ask everybody to do case studies. And I'm going to assign the case studies uh, in the next, uh, towards the end of this week, uh, before our next class, so that you can have a, about two or three weeks to work on it. Okay? And the case studies will deal with particular basins around the world that are transboundary, and I'm going to be asking you to look at everything water in those basins that uh, you want to bring up as an issue. So if you want to bring up human rights or uh, transboundary water claims or water pollution or anything like that. But I'll, I'll more, more information on that as, as uh, uh, when I make the assignments. Any questions or comments? All right. Then we'll see you all.